The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples of the earth. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king is in his might, and he loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is the Lord. And Father, we desire to do just that today. We want to declare that you are Lord who reigns over all the peoples of this earth. We declare that you are the Lord over this one nation of Korea. Though divided by a political line, we know that in the eyes of the spiritual realm, we are still one nation and you are the Lord over Korea. So let the peoples of this nation tremble before you and declare that you are the king over all. You are great in this place. And Father, we also thank you that you are a king who loves justice. So Lord, would you establish justice and righteousness in this nation? For those who are in prison camps in the north of us, that you would establish justice and set captives free. And Father, we also declare that you are the Lord over this place. And we ask that you would release your spirit to soften hearts so that our heart's desire would be to honor you. So that everything that happens today, our praises that we lift up, our prayers, the hearing of the word, our response to that word would be out of a motive of love and honor back to you. Father, I ask for your strength at this time, that you would fill me with your spirit, strengthen the inner man inside of me today, so that all that I say, all that I think, all that I do would be pleasing in your sight and bring glory to the name of Jesus. Lord, we desire this place to be a house of prayer. We desire this place to be a house of worship where Christ is exalted and adored, revered and cherished, treasured above all other things or people in our lives. And so as we gather, wash us with the power of your word. Cleanse us with the power of your spirit so that we will leave more like Jesus and we will leave more in love with Jesus. So Father, use your son now for your glory. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, the thoughts that run through my mind be pleasing and honorable in your sights. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And it is in that precious name we pray. Amen. You know, I recently saw the movie 42, uh, which is the story of Jackie Robinson, who was the first African-American baseball player for the Major League Baseball League. Uh, he went through incredible racism and injustice as opposing players, managers, and even fans would hurl insults and death threats at him and his family just because he was black. He was a great ball player, and eventually his ability to play ball was evident by everyone, and he paved the way for the minorities, for the black athletes of society today, for even the Asian athletes and all other minority groups. He was the pioneer who fought through much of the political and racist uh, agendas that was seeking to block him, and we are the beneficiaries. Uh, the freedom that we experience of watching the greats such as Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant and all these other great athletes who are black now playing in major sports leagues, uh, we really have Jackie Robinson to thank for taking the blunt of the uh, hits that came his way. But, you know, that was a big gamble back in that day, you know, by the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers at that time for breaking through the color barrier, which happened in 1947. And uh, near the end of the movie, uh, Jackie Robinson, he asks the owner, why did you do this? Why did you take a chance on me? Why did you go through all this mess 
when racism was the norm, why take a chance on a black player in the midst of all the hatred of their day? Why did you, as the owner, face the hatred of the fans and the media, the cursing of all the opposing people? Why did you do it? And he replied, said, you know, it's because that's not what this game is supposed to look like. Baseball isn't supposed to have hatred for players because of skin color. We're supposed to see the best players out on the fields. And he said, the ultimate motive of why I did this is because of my love for the game. And seeing the bigotry, seeing the racism, seeing the division, my love for the game was stronger than the hatred that he saw elsewhere. And as the movie finished, uh, I was really moved by what just uh, what I just witnessed, and I saw a lot of parallels with the arena of the sports league that was extremely filled with the sin of racism, and also strong parallels with what often happens within the church as well. That the church will often sometimes embrace worldly values that are sinful, and when God looks upon the league of his church, per se, uh, it is not what he intended the church to look like. You see, there's a certain way that the church was supposed to live, to love, and to look like. And it was not meant to look like the ways of the world. The church is not meant to reflect the hatred or the racism of the world. Instead, the church is supposed to look different from the value system of this world. And that's what our passage will be addressing today. Uh, today, James reminds us of what the church is supposed to look like. And if we were to summarize it in one word, that word to describe the church would be family. We are a family, a family of faith. It is evident by the language that James uses throughout his letter, who, and he keeps using uh, this language of family time and time again, calling them my beloved brothers, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord. And he is making it clear that what the church is supposed to look like is a family that is based on faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's another way that we could call the church, that it is a family of faith. But a lot of us come from dysfunctional families. A lot of us come from families that didn't quite get along, or maybe your father or mother or both did not spend a lot of time with you growing up. And so you're like, okay, if it's supposed to be a family, I don't even really know what a healthy family is supposed to look like. And that's what James will help us understand today. So if we are a family of faith, what does that really look like to be a family centered around faith in Christ? And so we'll explore that today. Turn with me to James chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 13 as we continue our study through the book of James. And today we shall explore what the church is supposed to look like. Follow along with me in your outline as well. So the first uh, point of our message today so, what are the marks of a true family of faith? Uh, well, first of all, the family of faith gives honor. So, everyone repeat, the family of faith gives honor. All right, so that's where we begin. So, when the Spirit of God brings and breathes new life into a community that loves Jesus, one fruit that will work out of that faith will be an expression of honor towards others. Let's look at James chapter 2, verse 1. It says, my brothers and sisters, so again, he begins with family language here, my brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So those who have faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, will show no partiality, or another way we could say it is, will show no favoritism. Another way of saying this verse, verse 1, would be, do you who show acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus? And so it's asking, if you're showing favoritism to a certain group of people more than others within the body of Christ, within the family of faith, James is also asking, do you really 
You who show favor, do you really have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? Why does he ask that? It is because faith and favoritism do not mix. Faith sees all of life as gifts. Faith also means that you understand that each person is a sinner in need of saving grace. And faith means that you understand that a person's value, a person's beauty, and a person's worth does not come from exterior things. That is the value system of the world that is not supposed to govern how we live and how we view other people. A person's worth is not based on how much money they have, nor where they live, or the color of their skin, or their level of education, or where they work, how much they make. But instead, kingdom citizens have a higher standard by which we view people. And that is through the lens of love and the governance of grace. So instead of giving judgments based on worldly standards, the people of faith give honor Because we see people with the correct perspective. And so how are we to apply that? We say, because you hold the image of God, I honor you for that. Because you are a child of God, I honor you for that. And because you're a fellow brother and sister with us sharing the same Father in heaven, I give you honor for that. So turn to somebody next to you right now and say, I honor you. See, it doesn't come natural, even when you're forced to do that. But that phrase needs to be a regular part of our vocabulary as the people of faith within the family of faith. I honor you because you are made in the image of God. I honor you because you are a child of God. I honor you because we are brothers and sisters who serve God the one true God. Amen? So learn to incorporate that into your language, into your theology, into your life within the community. Honor is a mark of the kingdom community. But when we show favoritism instead, that destroys this mindset and sees people as valuable based on the wrong things. We elevate people because of the degree that they have, the education, the school that they went to. Growing up in a Korean church, I can not tell you how many times people have introduced someone to me. Okay, say, hey, Pastor Eddie, I want you to meet my, my son, my daughter visiting from, you know, college. Or I want you to meet my niece and my nephew. And they'll all say, they study at Harvard. As if now I'm supposed oh my goodness, can I kiss your feet? I mean, that's really the, that's the kind of reaction that they want. They want me to somehow be impressed or to love them more or to value them more because of the school that they go to. But that is the value system of the world, not the value system of the kingdom of God. You see, what they're implying is that If you go to a certain school, make a certain amount of money, drive a certain amount of car, then you're more valuable because what you have is more expensive. But that's not the value system in God's kingdom. Because they're also saying if you didn't go to these schools, if you didn't get that kind of job, if you don't make that kind of money, then you're not as valuable. You see, we elevate people over others because of power, position, possessions, popularity, But we need to understand that within this family of faith, it is one where we learn to honor each other with the value system of his kingdom. You know, uh, before I got married, there was uh, this really nice restaurant that someone took me to. uh, And my friend was pretty well off. And so he took us in like this, his really nice car. I think it was like a Mercedes Benz or something like that. And Um, You know, we get off and there's valet parking and then we're escorted up to the restaurant area in this nice hotel and we eat a really nice meal and I thank my friend for this. We go back and we're treated like royalty. And I was like, this is really nice. And again, I was dating my wife at the time and I was like, I want to take her there. And so, uh, you know, back then, you know, I had a a very rusty old small Kia Pride uh, that there... 
that's been handed down for over like 15 years. Different missionaries who stayed in Korea for like six months at a time, they had it. This, the last missionary, they're going to throw away that car. And then uh, one of the missionary kids, she was my student at the university I was teaching at, and she goes, do you need a car? I was like, sure. You know, how much? Was like, Free. I was like, okay, that's a good price. And so that's the kind of car it was, right? It was rusty everywhere. They were ready to throw it away. Okay, that's the kind of car I had, all right? But I was happy. It was free. Got me around. And so I pick up, you know, my, uh, girl, my wife, girlfriend at the time. I pick her up in that car, which we always went on our dates. And then, you know, I'm like telling her about this really nice place that I went to. I want to take you there too. It has valet parking, really nice. We get there. And then the guy's like, excuse me, can you park that car around the hotel, please? I was like, what? Is this the same hotel? What happened? Basically, he's saying, can you get that ugly car out of here? You know, we do not want people to see that kind of car within our establishment. You know? And I was shocked at how different they treated. I was still, I'm still the same person. Right? I was just with a different person in a different car, and I got radically different treatment. And then my wife went, are you sure it's valet party? Yeah, I'm positive. I was just here. <laughs> You see, the world elevates you if you have the right stuff. It will praise you over other people if you got the right stuff. But the only person who is worthy to be elevated and praised above other people is our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the only person who is worthy to be elevated above others. Amen? You see, in God's kingdom, our value system sees people differently. And that is through the lens of love governed by grace. Then James gives a very practical example of how this sin of favoritism can creep up into our churches. Look at verses 2 and following. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly... And a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention, meaning special attention is given to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place on this comfortable chair while you say to the poor man, hey, you, you stand over there or you sit at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? We do this all the time, don't we? We judge others based on appearance. And that is a deeply ingrained sin of this Asian culture. Korea is so image-driven, so image-conscious. It's all about what you dress, the label that you wear, the school that you attended, the school that your children attend. It's all image-driven. But that is not what the church is supposed to look like. We treat poorer people as if they were lesser people. Verse 5, listen, my beloved brothers. So again, he's talking to the church here. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's saying, listen, church, listen, my family of faith, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppose you, who oppress you, and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? He now gets to the key point behind his displeasure with favoritism. He says, when you show favoritism, you not only elevate the other person above another, you dishonor them. Look at verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor man by elevating other men above him. Kingdom culture is based on honor. You know, there's a story that's been going around Facebook recently that touched upon this principle. Now, to be clear, that story is actually not true, this story, but it makes for a fascinating uh, realization of what goes on the human heart within the church concerning this very sin of favoritism. And this is the story. Pastor Jeremiah uh, Stepnik transformed himself to look like a homeless person when he went to the 10,000 member church that he was to be introduced as the head pastor that morning. He walked around uh, his soon-to-be church 
for 30 minutes prior to the service starting uh, while it was filling up with the congregation members. Only three people out of the, t- out of the 10,000 said hello to him. He asked people for change to buy food. Only one in the church gave him any change. He went into the sanctuary to sit down in the front of the church and was asked by the ushers if he would please sit in the back. He greeted people, only to be greeted back with stares and dirty looks, with people looking down on him and judging him. As he sat in the back of the church, he listened to the church announcements, and when those announcements came, the elders went up on stage, and they were excited to introduce their new pastor to the church congregation. We would like to introduce to you Pastor Jeremy Stebnick, and the congregation looked around clapping with joy and anticipation. The homeless man sitting in the back stood up and started walking down the aisle. The clapping soon stopped with all the eyes on him. He walked up to the altar and took the microphone from the elders who were in on this and paused for a moment, looking into the eyes of all the people who had just ignored him. Looking into the eyes of all the people who had just rejected him. And then he said this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me and I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger and invite you in, needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. After he recited this, he looked towards the congregation and told them all that he had experienced that morning. Many began to cry and many heads were bowed down. And then he said, today I see a gathering of people just like the world, not a gathering of the church of Jesus Christ. And he says, the world has enough people, but not enough disciples. When will we become true disciples? And then he dismissed them until next week. Well, like I said, it's not, you probably read it uh, in the stories that you've been uh, following here and there. It's not true, again, just to clarify. But one of my friends who shared this on her Facebook, uh, she was actually an usher in her church. And this is what she wrote. She said that she was in tears when she first read this story because she knew in her heart that if this happened at her church as, as an usher, she said she knew she would have treated that pastor the exact same way. But that's not what the church is supposed to look like. Out of all the places in the world, it is in the church where we stand on the common ground of honor and humility. We are on the common ground of honor because we are all made in the image of God. We stand on the common ground of humility because we are all sinners, saved by grace and in need of His saving grace each moment of our lives. So we don't look at people the same way the world does. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at outer appearance, but the Lord looks at the hearts. And that is the value system that we need to understand, that it does not matter what school you came from. It does not even matter if you ever went to, to college or high school. Your diplomas do not matter in the kingdom of God. Your value comes from God, from being made in his image, from being being adopted as his child. That is more valuable than a PhD and a $1 million salary. That is kingdom values that the church must embrace. Amen? Amen. And the heart that has been renewed by the power of the gospel not only receives this honor, it gladly gives this honor to others. So in the family of faith, one key trait is honor, to bless people, for they have been made in his image. That is why we honor life from the womb to the tomb and every stage in between. 
We honor life because God is the giver of that life. But that's not all. Yes, we give honor, but what is that really a reflection of? When you bestow honor to someone, what does that really reveal? It leads us to our second point, and that is that the family of faith gives love. So everyone repeat, the family of faith gives love. You see, honor is ultimately an expression of love. Verse 8 of uh, James 2, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. So why should we treat the poor, those different from us, the awkward socially people with respect and honor because of the royal law that scripture commands to love your neighbor as yourself? How would I want to be treated is how I should treat others. But when this law of love is broken, conflict happens and sin abounds. This issue is ultimately a love issue. Look at verse 5 again of James 2. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Now, it's not saying that all poor people are saved or all poor people have faith or all poor people do not covet money. He's not saying that. But he is saying that when you don't have money in your bank accounts... That means that you are able to trust God for your next meal in a way that we will not understand. So so they are rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom. And then he says this, which he has promised to those who love him. So it's an expression of love. Honoring the outcast or the poor or those different from us, that is ultimately an expression of our love to God. How we treat others is a reflection of our love for Jesus. Our ability to love others is determined by our ability to know God's love for us. If I think God's love for me is conditional, then I place conditions on others. But if I believe God's love for me is grace, is gift, and I am amazed by that, then I gladly give that same grace to others. But for many in the church in James's day, they didn't think it was a big deal. Why? Because everybody's doing it. Just like back in Jackie Robinson's day, all the managers, they didn't care that there was racism, segregation. They didn't care that they treated blacks. Why? Because everybody's doing it. Because the majority has the same attitude, has the same mindset, does the same sins, we think it's no big deal. Everybody we know spends lavishly on selfish reasons with our money, so it's no big deal because everybody does it. I know people who spend more money on themselves than I do. So as I compare myself to that, I'm not too bad. It's no big deal because everybody does it. And James is addressing that issue right here. saying, if you treat rich people better than the poor, he says, the church is like, who cares? Everybody does it. If you ignore the mentally or socially challenged, who cares? Everybody ignores them. If you gossip about someone in your church because you know their sin, big deal. Everybody does it. But James says, no, 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 no. That's not what the church is supposed to look like. Verse 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing what? Sin. Did you know that? That favoritism, elevating others as better than someone else, dishonoring the poor, did you know that that's sin? It says you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as sinners, transgressors. It is a sin to show favoritism. It is a sin that Jesus had to die for. Verses 10 and 11. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. You violated the law. You are a sinner. So he's saying to not love the poor, the socially awkward, is to sin. And that attitude is ultimately not loving towards God. So he wants to show that people, the, for the people who are like, you know, we do this all the time. We, we're very greedy. We're very judgmental. We're very, uh, show a lot of favoritism. We're like, no big deal because everybody does. It's like, no, 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 time out. You need to see it for what it really is. So he's saying if you violate one law, you violate all of them, right? It's the same. 
Because how many times do you have to kill someone before you're officially called a murderer? Just once. You can't say, I only murdered once. It's not like I murder every day. Come on. No, you, sin, you murder once, you're considered a murderer. How many times do you have to steal before you're considered a thief? Just once. And how many times do you have to sin before you're considered a sinner in the eyes of heaven? Just once. And that's what James is stressing. That, too, is a sin. It is sin that is harming the body of Christ. He's saying every sin is a violation of God's law. Every sin is an offense to God's heart. Every sin is the reason why Jesus had to die. Therefore, the key thrust of this portion of James, he is saying don't get comfortable with the sin of favoritism. Don't let that sin get comfortable in your life. We are to be a people of honor and of love. Don't take sin lightly. You see, judging others based on superficial things, that is the sin of not loving our neighbors as ourselves. God loves the poor. God loves the oppressed. Proverbs 17, 5 says, Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. Now look at that connection he's saying. He is connecting the poor person with the maker of that life. Every person you see is valuable because they were made on purpose for the purposes of God. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. You see, what the church is supposed to look like is a community of love. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. How? By the way that you love one another. As Ken Sandy says in his book, The Peacemaker, which we're all doing in our small groups this semester, he says, Jesus' reputation to a watching world depends on our unity and our ability to love each other. And that's why we're doing that book in our small groups. That's because we want to look like how the church is supposed to look like in this watching world. The church is not meant to be a community that focuses on what's in it for me, but rather what can I give to bless and strengthen this church. You know, I came across this interesting list of 12 reasons why pastors quit attending sports events. Did you know there was a survey done? 12 reasons why pastors quit attending sports events. And it's not just because it's on Sundays, all right? Anyway, okay. Thank you for the three people who got that one. All right. All right, so 12 reasons. Reason number one, why do pastors quit attending sports events? Number one, the coach never came to visit me. Number two, every time I went, somebody was asking for money. Number three, the people sitting in my row, they didn't seem very friendly. Number four, the seats were really uncomfortable. Number five, the referees made decisions that I didn't completely agree with. Number six, I was sitting with a bunch of hypocrites. They didn't come for the game. They were only looking at what other people were wearing. Number seven, some games went into overtime and I was late going home. Number eight, the band played some songs that I never heard of. Number nine, the games are scheduled on my only day off to sleep in and run errands. Number 10, my parents took me to too many games when I was growing up. I'm tired of games. Number 11, you know, I read a book on sports, and I feel I know more than the coaches anyway. Number 12, I don't want to take my children because I want them to choose for themselves what sports they like. If you connect the dots, you realize that that actually is some of the top reasons why people quit the church. And it's all centered around me. But that's not what the church was supposed to look like. Sandy talks about this in his book as well. He says some of the hurdles towards true peace and reconciliation, some of the hurdles towards true unity that the body is supposed to experience is the worldly philosophy and mindset that we let become normative within church life. Things like this mentality, that we got to look out for number one, that God doesn't want me to stay unhappy because we think 
If I'm unhappy, this is not God's will because obviously God's ultimate purpose for existence is my happiness. Or I'll forgive, I just will not forget, okay? Or don't get mad, get even. Or I deserve better than this. And we take this mentality that's alive in the world and we take it into the church. So it's, hey, you know, I come here. Nobody talks to me, even though you don't make an effort to talk to anybody. Nobody's serving me, even though we're called to serve the body. You see, if we come waiting for, if everybody comes waiting for someone to serve them, no one gets served. But if we all come ready to serve others, then everyone gets served. And this is the mindset that must be the mark of the community of faith. But this is not the mindset of the one who loves his neighbor as himself. You know, when I was on sabbatical in Sydney several years ago, uh, being on sabbatical was neat because you finally, as a pastor, uh, you rarely get a chance to visit other churches, uh, you know, obviously unless you're a guest speaker or something, but just to go to a different church. So it was my sabbatical year. And one of the first churches that we went to, um, it was like 80 to 100 people, and it was right across the street from me. And we went to various churches, uh, but it was clear when we went to all these different churches uh, which places had a culture of love and which did not. Uh, the, f- the first church that I mentioned, it was just right across the street from where we live, so we went there for the first few weeks of our sabbatical. Um, and it was a very tight-knit group, about again, about 80 to 100 people. And not one person would talk to me, even if I would approach them and say, oh, hi, I'm Eddie, I'm new. They would be like, hi. And then they would go back to their friends. And it was a little bit weird. So after three weeks of that, I was like, okay, we'll try someplace else, right? Uh, But other churches that I went to, they had an amazing culture where everyone made you feel welcome. Uh, There's one church that I went to, I kid you not, like I walk in and suddenly somebody sees me, runs across the lobby area and says, hi, how are you doing? And I'd be like, are you talking to me? And then I'm like, do we know each other? Uh, We never met, but she could clearly tell that I was new. And so she went out of her way to make sure that I was welcomed, and she introduced me to other people. And I was really impressed by that. Uh, And that made me want to go back. And so I realized that type of culture and environment is the most like the heart of God within a church. Because his heart's is welcoming and warm to those who approach him. You see, the family of faith is one that loves one another. And it takes deep faith to do this. Faith that knows and believes that I am loved by God. Strong faith in God's love for me becomes the source of my identity, the source of my security, and it gives me the confidence to love freely. You see, when I am uncertain of God's love for me, when I doubt God's love for me, I become self-conscious and all focused on wanting people to notice and pamper me. But when I am secure in God's love, that love has an overflowing effect where we desire to be a blessing, to give to others. We become others-focused and God-conscious instead of self-conscious. And I'm praying that OEM would grow in this kind of culture because that's a culture of God's kingdom and that's what the church is supposed to look like. Amen? I ask for your prayers concerning that. And I would love it if each of us were so secure in the love that God has for us that we would gladly lavish love to others. And I hope that you will know so deeply that you are loved that you will be able to love others freely and abundantly. You know, I want to thank those who prayed, our staff and those who came to Fire by Night uh, last Friday, uh, know that I had to take kind of a last minute, literally a 24-hour trip to Bangkok. Um, uh, I was invited to have some meetings with people to discuss uh, what I shared several weeks ago about uh, caring for orphans in neighboring countries of high uh, persecution and vulnerability. Uh, for South Korea and for our expat community to be foster parents to those types of orphans, things like that. So I was invited for um, some meetings to meet with like people from the U.S. government and various other people from uh, Thailand, Korea, stuff like that. And um, that 24-hour period in Thailand and about six hours prior and six hours afterward, it was filled with so much warfare. 
Um, it was uh, pretty awkward at times. There were some good moments. There were some good meetings where people were very much wanting to partner together to make that possibility of caring for these orphan, orphans happen. But there were other moments uh, that suddenly um, they would harshly criticize uh, me as a pastor, us as a church for trying to be involved in what they saw as a political agenda and all these things like that. Um, and also what proved to me that this was warfare is like right before I left and right after I left, I also got some nasty emails trying to disrupt and discourage our justice movements towards various things. And um, in some of the mo meetings that I had that were on the more difficult side, um, you know, it's like I'm sharing uh, what we know, what we're seeking to do, and the way that we can make this happen, and getting some of the resistance, and uh, getting also some pretty sharp words along the way. I felt so alone uh, in some of these meetings. Uh, I felt like I was a lone voice uh, trying to fight for this issue. And it was really awkward. I felt so lonely, you know. Uh, and as I was, um, you know, so I, like, I, my love language, like if you do the love language thing, my love language of receiving is words of affirmation. So words affect me, can affect me really deeply at sometimes. And so as there, these people and these emails are bombarding me within such a short period of time, within these, like, 30-hour time period, all of a sudden, you know, it's like I was on the airplane at, like, 1.30 a.m. coming back here on Saturday morning, and I was having my own little pity party, self-pity party on the plane. And I was like, oh, man, I felt so alone. And I was like, I felt so lonely. It's like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe he said that. I can't believe they said I can't, oh my, I can't believe they doubted our motive. You know, I'm going through all this pity party, right? And then the Spirit of God convicted my heart. God spoke to me in my heart. He says, Eddie, yes, you, you, that's fine. You felt alone, okay, in that room. You felt alone, lonely in that meeting when there was opposition against what you're trying to do. But then the Spirit of God spoke. He said, you know what? Uh, there are 27 million slaves in this world who feel a lot more alone than you do. Those traffic that we're fighting for. There are over 152 million orphans in this world who feel a lot more alone and lonely than you do, Eddie. And all of a sudden, I had to repent of that self-pity mode that I was in. And I, was, I became thankful. I said, God, thank you that you let me get just a small taste. I can't even compare. I don't even want to say that I really know what these trafficked victims and what these orphans really feel like because we have been blessed to have been raised in a family community and not in an institution. So at least on that level, I can be thankful, right? And so all of a sudden, I became thankful that, man, I, I got a taste of what we are fighting for, of who we are fighting for. And then again, I'm so selfish. Right after that, I was like, okay, God, I repent of that. But then I was like thinking about some of the people that I met and these emails that I was sandwiched within, the, within that time. And all of a sudden, I, my self-pity came back and I said, but you know what, God? That person was so mean. Okay? I was like, man, no, really, I'm like, that was evil, right? Mean, mean, evil, mean, mean, evil, right? And I was like, and I'm like, oh, right? Trying to pray, bless my enemies, but it's really hard, you know? trying to practice the peacemaking principles, right? <sighs> but as I was wrestling through that, thing, mean, the Spirit of God spoke to me again. He says, Eddie, okay, yes. <laughs> you felt like he was very mean to you and very evil. And then God said, you know what? For these 27 million traffic victims, for a lot of these millions of orphans, they encounter someone far more evil every day. And all of a sudden, it put everything into proper perspective again as to why I had those meetings, as to why we keep pursuing justice for the orphan, for the traffic victim, and for these who are oppressed. I'm glad that God gave me a small taste of it. I could barely last one day of it, but there are millions around the world who have to face that day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. And that's why we do this, because that is what the church is supposed to look like. It is supposed to be a vessel of grace and of love, especially 
for the oppressed. That is God's heart. God loves these poor, homeless, oppressed, orphaned, trafficked people whom God loves, whom God died for. Amen? So the family of faith is marked by honor and love. But honestly, we fail at all of these, don't we? <laughs> Let's be honest, right? We fail to give honor. Some of us, we couldn't even get that out of our mouth earlier today, right? Say to turn to somebody next to you, I honor you. Oh, <laughs> I've never said that before, right? So we fail to give honor. We fail to truly love so often. So then what else do we need in the church then since we fail time and time again? And that leads us to the third thing that must mark the family of faith. And that is that the family of faith gives mercy. So everyone repeat, the family of faith gives mercy. Let's look at chapter uh, 2 of James, verses 12 and 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So <clears throat> judgment without mercy will be given to those who show no mercy. So we can only give what we have. Right? So if we don't have love in our hearts, we're not going to exude love. If we don't have mercy in our hearts, we're not going to exude mercy. We're going to exude judgment. But when we are full from feasting on God's love, then we have plenty of love and mercy to offer to others. Because we love because he first loved us. You see... What you want in your heart of hearts, what you want to give to others, reveals what you deserve to get. If you really, in your heart of heart, want judgment to fall upon others, then that's what you deserve to get. But if you really, in your heart of hearts, want grace to be bestowed upon others, then that is what you deserve to get. You see, what you want to give to others is also what will follow you in the end. It's the principle of reaping and sowing. You're going to reap whatever you sow. That's a biblical principle. But also, what you want to give to others is what will follow you in that same way in the end. Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In this family of faith, we fail to give honor, love, and mercy over and over again. And though we are empty of these things, though we are empty of honor, love, and mercy, Jesus has chosen to make the first move and to bestow honor to us, to bestow love to us, bestow mercy to us. And then not only give it to us, but to pour it out into our lives and our hearts. When we turn to him in faith, he pours out that love, honor, and mercy within our hearts so that we can give it to others. Honestly and humbly to say, as this prayer by Piper says, Father, I am empty, but you are full. I am hungry, but you are the bread of heaven. I am thirsty, but you are the fountain of life. I am weak, but you are strong. I am poor, but you are rich. I am foolish, but you are all wise. I am broken, but you are whole. I am dying, but your steadfast love is better than life. Far too many times we don't look like Jesus. But we can turn to Jesus and point people to Jesus. And in so doing, in the end, they will be able to see Jesus through his church. Amen. Let's pray.